Chapter 2 of the Chronicles of Avonlea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chronicles of Avonlea by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 2 Old Lady Lloyd. Section 2 The June Chapter. There were no Mayflowers in June, but now the old lady's garden was full of blossoms, and every morning Sylvia found a bouquet of them by the beach. The perfumed ivory of white narcissus, the flame of tulips, the fairy branches of bleeding heart, the pink and snow of little thorny single sweet-breathed early roses. The old lady had no fear of discovery, for the flowers that grew in her garden grew in every other Spencervale garden as well, including the Stuart garden. Chris Stewart, when he was teased about the music teacher, merely smiled and held his peace. Chris knew perfectly well who was the real giver of those flowers. He had made it his business to find out when the Mayflower gossip started. But since it was evident Old Lady Lloyd did not wish it to be known, Chris told no one. Chris had always liked Old Lady Lloyd ever since the day, ten years before, when she had found him crying in the woods with a cut foot and had taken him into her house and bathed and bound the wound and given him ten cents to buy candy at the store. The old lady went without supper that night because of it, but Chris never knew that. The old lady thought it a most beautiful June. She no longer hated the new days. On the contrary, she welcomed them. Every day is an uncommon day now, she said jubilantly to herself, for did not almost every day bring her a glimpse of Sylvia? Even on rainy days the old lady gallantly braved rheumatism to hide behind her clump of dripping spruces and watch Sylvia pass. The only days she could not see her were Sundays, and no Sundays had ever seemed so long to old lady Lloyd as those June Sundays did. One day the egg peddler had news for her. "'The music teacher is going to sing a solo for collection piece tomorrow,' he told her. The old lady's black eyes flashed with interest. I didn't know Miss Gray was a member of the choir, she said. Jined two Sundays ago. I tell you, our music is something worth listening to now. The church will be packed tomorrow, I reckon. Her name's gone all over the country for singing. You ought to come and hear it, Miss Lloyd. The peddler said this out of bravado, merely to show he wasn't scared of the old lady for all her grand airs. The old lady made no answer, and he thought he had offended her. He went away, wishing he hadn't said it. Had he but known it, the old lady had forgotten the existence of all and any egg peddlers. He had blotted himself and his insignificance out of her consciousness by his last sentence. All her thoughts, feelings, and wishes were submerged in a very whirlpool of desire to hear Sylvia sing that solo. She went into the house in a tumult and tried to conquer that desire. She could not do it, even though she summoned all her pride to her aid. Pride said, you will have to go to church to hear her. You haven't fit clothes to go to church in. Think what a figure you will make before them all. But for the first time a more insistent voice than pride spoke to her soul, and for the first time the old lady listened to it. It was too true that she had never gone to church since the day on which she had to begin wearing her mother's silk dresses. The old lady herself thought that this was very wicked, and she tried to atone by keeping Sunday very strictly, and always having a little service of her own, morning and evening. She sang three hymns in her cracked voice, prayed aloud, and read a sermon. But she could not bring herself to go to church in her out-of-date clothes. She, who had once set the fashions in Spencer Vale, and the longer she stayed away, the more impossible it seemed that she should ever again go. Now the impossible had become not only possible, but insistent. She must go to church and hear Sylvia sing, no matter how ridiculous she appeared, no matter how people talked and laughed at her. Spencervale Congregation had a mild sensation the next afternoon. Just before the opening of service, Old Lady Lloyd walked up the aisle and sat down in the long, unoccupied Lloyd pew in front of the pulpit. The old lady's very soul was writhing within her. She recalled the reflection she had seen in her mirror before she left, the old black silk in the mode of thirty years agone, and the queer little bonnet of shirred black satin. She thought how absurd she must look in the eyes of her world. As a matter of fact, she did not look in the least absurd. 
Some women might have, but the old lady's stately distinction of carriage and figure was so subtly commanding that it did away with the consideration of garmenting altogether. The old lady did not know this, but she did know that Mrs. Kimball, the storekeeper's wife, presently rustled into the next pew in the very latest fashion of fabric and mode. She and Mrs. Kimball were the same age, and there had been a time when the latter had been content to imitate Margaret Lloyd's costumes at a humble distance. But the storekeeper had proposed, and things were changed now, and there sat poor old Lady Lloyd feeling the change bitterly, and half wishing she had not come to church at all. Then all at once the angel of love touched their foolish thoughts, born of vanity and morbid pride, and they melted away as if they had never been. Sylvia Gray had come into the choir, and was sitting just where the afternoon sunshine fell over her beautiful hair like a halo. The old lady looked at her in a rapture of satisfied longing, and thenceforth the service was a blessing to her, as anything is blessed which comes through the medium of unselfish love, whether human or divine. Nay, are they not one and the same, differing in degree only, not in kind? The old lady had never had such a good, satisfying look at Sylvia before. All her former glimpses had been stolen and fleeting. Now she sat and gazed upon her to her hungry heart's content, lingering delightedly over every little charm and loveliness, the way Sylvia's shining hair rippled back from her forehead, the sweet little trick she had of dropping quickly her long-lashed eyelids when she encountered too bold or curious a glance, and the slender, beautifully modeled hands, so like Leslie Gray's hands, that held her hymn-book. She was dressed very plainly in a black skirt and a white shirt-waist, but none of the other girls in the choir, with all their fine feathers, could hold a candle to her, as the egg peddler said to his wife, going home from church. The old lady listened to the opening hymns with keen pleasure. Sylvia's voice thrilled through and dominated them all, but when the ushers got up to take the collection, an undercurrent of subdued excitement flowed over the congregation. Sylvia rose and came forward to Janet Moore's side at the organ. The next moment her beautiful voice soared through the building like the very soul of melody, true, clear, powerful, sweet. Nobody in Spencervale had ever listened to such a voice except old Lady Lloyd herself, who, in her youth, had heard enough good singing to enable her to be a tolerable judge of it. She realized instantly that this girl of her heart had a great gift, a gift that would some day bring her fame and fortune if it could be duly trained and developed. "'Oh, I'm so glad I came to church,' thought old Lady Lloyd. When the solo was ended, the old lady's conscience compelled her to drag her eyes and thoughts from Sylvia and fasten them on the minister, who had been flattering himself all through the opening portion of the service that old Lady Lloyd had come to church on his account. He was newly settled, having been in charge of the Spencervale congregation only a few months. He was a clever little fellow, and he honestly thought it was the fame of his preaching that had brought old Lady Lloyd out to church. When the service was over, all the old lady's neighbors came to speak to her with kindly smile and handshake. They thought they ought to encourage her now that she had made a start in the right direction. The old lady liked their cordiality, and liked it none the less because she detected in it the same unconscious respect and deference she had been wont to receive in the old days, a respect and deference which her personality compelled from all who approached her. The old lady was surprised to find that she could command it still in defiance of unfashionable bonnet and ancient attire. Janet Moore and Sylvia Gray walked home from church together. "'Did you see old Lady Lloyd out today?' asked Janet. "'I was amazed when she walked in. She has never been to church in my recollection. What a quaint old figure she is! She's very rich, you know, but she wears her mother's old clothes and never gets a new thing.' Some people think she is mean, but, concluded Janet charitably, I believe it is simply eccentricity. I felt that was Miss Lloyd as soon as I saw her, although I had never seen her before, said Sylvia dreamily. I have been wishing to see her for a certain reason. She has a very striking face. I should like to meet her, to know her. I don't think it's likely you ever will, said Janet carelessly. She doesn't like young people, and she never goes anywhere. I don't think I'd like to know her. I'd be afraid of her. She has such stately ways and such strange, piercing eyes. I shouldn't be afraid of her, said Sylvia to herself as she turned into the Spencer Lane. But I don't expect I'll ever become acquainted with her. 
If she knew who I am, I suppose she would dislike me. I suppose she never suspects that I am Leslie Gray's daughter. The minister, thinking it well to strike while the iron was hot, went up to call on old Lady Lloyd the very next afternoon. He went in fear and trembling, for he had heard things about old Lady Lloyd. But she made herself so agreeable in her high-bred fashion that he was delighted, and told his wife when he went home that Spencer Vale people didn't understand Miss Lloyd. This was perfectly true, but it is by no means certain that the minister understood her either. He made only one mistake intact, but as the old lady did not snub him for it, he never knew he made it. When he was leaving, he said, I hope we shall see you at church next Sunday, Miss Lloyd. Indeed you will, said the old lady emphatically. End of Part 2 of Chapter 2